McKay Goodwin MG Academy. The uh, McKay Goodwin MG Academy webinar. So um, apologies for the small delay. We had a few technical issues at the beginning. Um, I think Zoom um, updates their app, and we uh, we need, it caused a few difficulties. So I think we're all back on. So today we're <laughs> going to have um, quite an interesting webinar. Um, joining me, I've got Professor Aditya from the University of Wollongong, and I've got David Pugh as Chairman of Equity. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is um, digital transformation, AI and robotics for finance and accounting. Um, so today's agenda, um, so obviously meet the speakers, as I said, we've got Professor Aditya from the University of Wollongong and David Pugh from Equity. Um, I'll give a brief introduction to MG Academy. Um, then we're going to pass the presentation to uh, Professor Aditya and he'll tell us how new technologies are making businesses easier. Um, and then I'll pass on to David Pugh, who will be uh, providing us a presentation on building a digital workforce. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll have um, some time for some Q um, Q&A. Um, also, by all means, if anyone has any questions during the presentation, um, there's a, um, a small um, icon at the bottom of your um, Zoom app, um, and you can actually put some questions in, um, in, the, in that app. Um, I'll try and uh, um, answer some questions if, um, if uh, uh, okay during the presentation. However, I'll leave most of them until the end of the, the webinar. Um, a bit of in uh, intro to MG Academy. So, Makai Goodwin, we are a corporate advisor and reconstruction firm. Um, and our academy webinars provide um, aim to provide bespoke business specialist content. Um, we hope that you know our presentations um, are able to provide upskilling um, for our attendees. And uh, the good news is that the MG Academy courses and webinars also count towards CPD points for accountants and lawyers. Now I'll pass the presentation to um, Professor Aditya. He'll give us a, uh, a, you know, a, a, a very interesting um, uh, 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 talk on how technologies are making businesses easier. Over to you, Professor. Thanks, Dom. Um, yes. Let's go to the right. Okay. So um, I, this is the obligatory slide I'm supposed to show wherever and whenever I go and give a talk. I won't spend time on it, but it's just a uh, a slide that tells you about my research lab. It's called the Decision Systems Lab at the University of Wollongong. We've been in business since 1998. We've worked with a bunch of interesting organizations in three main areas, enterprise computing, defense AI, and in medical, well, or what my medical colleagues call clinical informatics. And so you'll see from the logos, we've worked with companies like um, Xerox Research, IBM Research, uh, CSC nowadays called DXC, Samsung, and so on and so forth. Um, I guess the main point of what I want to really talk about is what uh, the new technologies sitting around the hype around AI are about. Tom, next slide. So, um, oops. yeah, okay. So, um, um, the, 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 the story starts with the idea of business process modeling and business process management. So across the world, across many organizations, there is now a recognition that we need to model our business processes. What are these business processes? These are repeatable sequences of activities that we go through for performing standard tasks. I mean, this is supposed to be an order to invoice business process. It's a standard template. Companies across the world use it. It looks ugly. The point, and we were having this quick chat before the start of this webinar. This is a kludgy model, and I deliberately picked one of this sort because that's the reality of how these things look like. So you have these business process models that somebody has spent a lot of time and effort to build. Um, and I can tell you a lot of time and a lot of effort because we've done a fair amount of work in process modeling for many organizations and it's very, very ugly. Um, but then you have to have them because supposedly the value proposition with these things is that you're able to talk in a language which is equally accessible to the technical types 
and the non-technical types. So that's the business process modeling language that you're looking at here. What do these things do? So amongst <clears throat> many things, it allows you to execute a business process. So these things are called executable specification languages, which there is a thing called a process engine, which will take a model like this and literally something that looks like this, you feed it into the process engine and it will take the model as a coordination model. It'll tell uh, the, the process engine what to demand next. Do the first task first, do the second task next, and so on and so forth. And so the coordination engine ensures that the right entities, the people, the agents, the software systems, the apps, the components, and so on, do the right thing at the right time under the right circumstances. So that's a coordination engine. That's a process engine, and a process engine runs a process model such as this. Now, interestingly, for the purposes of um, an audience which is, uh, is largely uh, ac accounting, uh, uh, financial uh, professionals, and possibly legal professionals, the interesting story is that um, <coughs> around the year 2001, Many of you will recall that there were these big scandals around a company called Enron and a company called WorldCom. And as a consequence of these financial scandals, uh, the US House of Congress passed a piece of legislation called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, also called SOX, S-O-X. Some of you probably know about it very well. So the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was a trigger for this huge, what became eventually and I, this is a very dated snapshot, but at some point I remember reading that it was a 16 billion US dollars per annum industry <coughs> around um, business process compliance. In fact, there were many, many case studies of Um, there's an interesting story right there in terms of how process modeling can help you execute your business processes, make sure that you do the right thing all the time over and over again, but also that you're doing the right thing in terms of the policies, the legislation, and the regulatory frameworks that apply. We're getting a bit of interference in the... In any case, so... so um, that's part one of the story. We have process models and the process models can be executed and the process models often play a very important role in compliance management. The next slide, Dom. So now there is this question of how difficult it is to acquire these process models. So they're, they're as I was saying, they're very expensive to build. They're very tedious to build. Um, but they can be, in many cases, extracted automatically from other kinds of data that might be sitting around. So process models often hide inside process execution data. Um, process execution data is of the form where you say uh, a certain task in an insurance claim handling process was done at 10 a.m. in the morning for this particular claim number and the resource, the person doing it was this person and so on. So you have these kinds of logs. These are routinely generated by most applications in the back end. So if you can pull these out, there are these techniques. There's a class of techniques called process mining that allows you to reverse engineer the process models, those kludgy things we saw in the previous slide from these logs. But it's not just these kinds of process logs. You can also see it in other forms of what we like to call nowadays digital dust, the digital trail of that we leave behind when we execute our activities in cyberspace. So these could be me message logs, email logs, things we say on social media, even video feed. All of these can be used as input to these tools that extract process models from them. And we just talked about compliance management, so that's a big thing as well. Now on the right-hand side, you'll see a couple of logos. Celonis is a very interesting story. It's currently the unicorn in this space. It sells 
process mining functionality. Minit is a, Salonis is based out of Munich. Minit is based out of Prague. And the one at the bottom is the latest acquisition of IBM. So IBM has its own process mining uh, tool. <coughs> and it's the one that you see there. Right, so um, why are we talking about process mining? So the story is leading to something and what it's leading to is this idea of process automation. So process mining is where <coughs> you extract the process step in where they think that they, there's an obvious flaw in what the, the process miner might have extracted and so on. So, <coughs> so you, you get your process models via process mining, and now you're all set to automate these processes. So remember, we already talked about process engines, which allow you to automatically execute the coordination model. So the business of making sure that the right thing is done first and the right thing is done second and so on and so forth, that bit is very easily and rather trivially automated. But the big brainwave that people had, it's very hard to pin down exactly when that brainwave occurred on mass to industry, but it would have occurred at some point in the last 20, 25 years. Um, the next slide, Dom. Um, so um, I'll, I'll come back to that bit of history in a second. But in the meantime, just to wrap up the story on process mining, there is this more general idea of process analytics. So in process analytics, you have, um, you have uh, essentially three kinds of things that you do. You do predictive analytics, you do diagnostic analytics, and you do prescriptive analytics. So let's take at least two of these and see what kinds of questions they help us answer. So with predictive analytics, you might want to ask the question, I've got a process instance. It's let's say an instance of an insurance claim handling process. How long will this take to complete? So this is where you're asking the prediction engine, tell me how long this will take to complete. How much will it cost? What resources will it consume? Will it deliver on what it's promised functionality is, will it deliver on the KPIs? And can we anticipate any problems down the track for this particular instance? Um, these are very compelling, very powerful questions. And these feed into what's called prescriptive analytics, where you're asking the question, okay, so what's the best next thing for me to do as I execute this instance of an insurance claim handling process? So this is what analytics, allows you to do. And this is the sort of um, interesting story that's built around the basic core of process mining that we were talking about. So <coughs> going back to history now. So Don, the next slide. So as I was saying, there's a very interesting bit of history as to how the thinking around um, process automation, indeed the, the term robotic process automation came about. <clears throat> so, um, so let me start from the recent bit first. So the, the person on the right-hand side in the top bar is Professor Leslie Wilcox from London School of Economics. So Professor Wilcox and I spent a day um, assessing PhD projects in Brisbane at QUT uh, in 2016, which was in fact the year where he was featured in the McKinsey uh, magazine as the person to, to pay attention to because the next acronym that you need to know, so this is circa 2016, McKinsey saying to everybody, the next acronym that you need to know is robotic process automation. So Leslie Wilcox was the guy who invented this term. Um, actually, it's a very interesting term because when he was saying robotic, he meant intelligent agents. Um, but then industry nowadays tends to use the term in a simplified fashion and simply, they simply say robotics 
very recently, a, a financial services company came by to our campus. And amongst the things they wanted to talk about with academics here was robotics. And true to academic fashion, our managers rolled out a bunch of researchers who work with robot arms and robotic vehicles. And they rolled them out to talk to this company. And when I saw those names, I said, no way. They're not interested in robot arms or robotic cars or things of that sort. When they say robotics, they mean RPA. So, so there was a, this, this uh, interesting choice of uh, naming by Leslie Wilcox led to, I can tell you, great confusion, particularly since academia thinks robotics is about hardware robotics. And thanks to Leslie and his colleagues, industry thinks robotics is about RPA or robotic process automation. But that aside, <clears throat> there are these two other faces that you'll see on the left. Um, the guy in the middle is a man called Mike Georgiev. Mike used to work for NASA and he made a name for himself building AI systems that were used to control the space shuttle. And in the late 1980s, he was invited by Bob Hawke to come back to Australia and head up an entity called the Australian AI Institute. And one of his first hires was a PhD from the University of Sydney from the same group that I eventually went and joined about three years later, a guy called Arun Rao. This is the guy on the right, on the extreme left. He is now the global head for AI at Ernst & Young. Uh, so Anand Rao had just finished his PhD and he went and joined the Australian AI Institute. And between Georgiev and Rao, they invented a lot of interesting things that remains in some sense the stuff of legend as far as um, intelligent agent technology is concerned. And there is a point of talking about this because eventually that technology is what led to the thinking that we can take our business processes and automate some of the steps. In principle, we can take our business processes and automate all of the steps. Now, <clears throat> I recall in the late 1990s at the major conferences and agent technology, um, the discussion used to be that, you know, there's a sweet spot where agents come in, which is where there is some amount of variation in how the processes are going to be executed. So there is some variability there, but um, it's, it's so, so it's, that's where you need agent technology. If it's just standard repetitive behavior that you want to encode, then agents are not terribly exciting. But many years later, industry woke up again and said, hey, that's right. We want to be able to use intelligent agents to automate the functionality that is being achieved inside those boxes in that kludgy business process model that I showed you at the beginning. So this led to the whole business around RPA, where the idea is that you're, <coughs> you're taking your um, process tasks and you're using AI to automate these. Now, there are different um, tools that sit at different points in that spectrum. Um, and, and lots of interesting activity in that space. But the basic premise holds, which is that you can take any business process and you can, in principle, I mean, this is the fundamental premise of AI, that you can do what used to be traditionally done by a human with a machine, with an intelligent agent. Now, what has happened since <coughs> is, of course, that there are certain things, there's recognition that not everything and not every process can be automated with AI. And that's very important to recognize at the outset. If I'm looking at a clinical process, if I'm looking at a process which involves performing complex surgery, there is no way with our current technology that I would venture to suggest that I can take the main tasks in that surgical process and I can get an agent to automate it. I can't, but there are certain tasks the kinds of, so the original value proposition was people were spending billions in outsourcing, you know, BPO, business process outsourcing to call centers and such. And a lot of that work could be automated because that was very low end functionality. There was no re real reason why a human should be doing it. You could as well get a machine to do it. So this is 
what led to the original value proposition for RPA or what if process automation, let's automate these simple things that we are paying a lot of humans to do and I can do it way cheaper with just automated agents doing these things. So this is how RPA started. It's now grown, it's become more exciting. There is a lot more activity in this space. Um, Dom, the next slide. So how will uh, RPA, where, where is it going? It's a kind of interesting, so, so it's a sort of thing that we do in academia as part of our job. We, we're in the business of technology foresight. So we want to predict what's around the curve. Um, there are some industry players in this space and David's gonna talk at length about the practical dimension of all of this. But some of these industry players that David might make reference to are nowadays talking about the idea of hyper automation, which is not just plain old vanilla automation, it's automation plus plus. It's, also, it's all about throwing in more whiz bang AI into the tool and solving more and more complex tasks, not solving so much as executing more and more complex tasks uh, using AI. <clears throat> but what will this give us? This will give us extreme flexibility. So one of the things that we observe routinely, and I have done extensive studies of this, uh, when you look at a large organization, I, I looked at IBM, and you look at the way their business processes are executed, the simple thing that you notice is that although the process model might say a certain, might, might suggest that there are certain standard ways of doing things, in actual fact, there is possibly an infinite space of possible variations which are, as we speak, being executed. And why are they being executed? Because the human operators that are doing these things know they have their insight, the, the, the knowledge that tells them that they could be doing these variations, these flexible variations of the processes, and that they make sense, they save money, they lead to happy customers, et cetera, et cetera. So we have till date relied on humans to do it. But the point now is that increasingly we're gonna see that we have the technological wherewithal to get machines to do it automatically without really having a human sit and super, supervise the exercise. So we're gonna see extreme flexibility. We're gonna see extreme personalization, which is to say every customer is different. Every client has his or her own unique needs. And we will create an experience around the individual, not around some generic class of all clients or all customers. That's powerful functionality. And I think we're on the cusp of achieving it. There's also the business of resource optimization. <coughs> so this is where you're saying that, you know, if I do certain things in certain ways, I can get things done much faster. This is an old observation that's as old as the area of operations research, industrial engineering, it's been around for at least 70 years. But being able to do it in a process execution context is powerful and we are on the cusp of being able to do that as well. Then there's the idea of adjustable autonomy. So adjustable autonomy is the idea that, you know, we're talking about autonomous problem solving, right? So autonomous functionality, but it's adjustable, which means that in certain settings, I will let the autonomous machinery, the agent, the robot, the whatever, do its own thing without batting an eyelid. I won't worry about it. But in other settings, I will insist that I have fine-grained oversight, which means that in certain settings, it's okay to let the agent do its thing. In other settings, it's important that the human supervise and carefully supervise in some cases. The ability to flip, flit back and forth between extreme autonomy and extreme supervision is important and everything in between is important. And we're heading in a direction where that's gonna be possible. There's also this idea of analyzing the resulting systems through the lens of socio-technical analysis. You know that these systems are ultimately complex mixes of machine and human functionality. How do we regulate them? We take inspiration from human society and we build uh, computational constructs from it that allow us to do the regulation. There is also, I'm, I'm gonna use a military metaphor, but there is this idea of fire and forget functionality which is to say that I press a button and I forget about it. 
the act of pressing the button invokes very complex AI machinery that solves very complex problems, executes complex business processes without us worrying too much about the detail of what's happening. Now, so there is a big area that's growing in importance called knowledge intensive business processes. This is the kind of thing that a accountant, a lawyer, a surgeon, a doctor, a specialist would execute. So this is where they're saying that there isn't a one size fits all sequence of activities to execute. There is really knowledge at play and the individual specialist operator's knowledge must be brought to bear. And there's infinitely many variations on how things are done. We trust these specialists because they have the knowledge that tells them that certain variations are valid, interesting, or useful. So um, there's knowledge intensive processes, but there's also fire and forget. So this is kind of a sense of, it gives you a sense of where we are heading. So we're going to see more and more automation, but we are going to also insist that there be uh, human involvement at a level that we are comfortable with um, all the time. And the result is going to be these systems, which as I said, have adjustable autonomy that determine the extent of human involvement based on the context at hand. There's many other things to tell you about. There's lots of other stories, but I think it's time now to hand over to David. David is going to tell you some real war stories and things that can be done in practice here and now with the tools available. So over to you, David. Thanks, Anita, and also thanks, Don, and welcome yeah. to everybody. Um, uh, can I take over the screen? Or yeah, what, what I'll do, sorry, what <laughs> I'll do first is in case I lose a QA, uh, when I stop sharing, I'll ask it now. Um, how long does a project make, take to make? Um, so, gee, I, gee, I'll write it down. I, well, yeah, I mean. Did, no, did, Dom, it's an important question. Yeah. Um, and I think you're going to get two very different answers. David's okay. going to give you a real number, and I'm going to say it depends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Look, um, <laughs> and we always, um, a lot of, you know, we always give a, um, um, you know, we, are, we get asked what we do, how long will it take? And we always say, well, it depends on how quickly you give us information and all the variables that come along with it. So <laughs> it's a, yeah, it'll right. be anything. Um, all right, what I'll do now, sorry, David, um, just in case I lose a question, I'll stop sharing my screen. And apologies, everyone. I had to quickly alternate from my PC to my laptop today um, because my computer just decided to stop working. So um, I'll stop sharing and I'll pass it over to uh, David. Okay, let me share my screen now with you. This thing will behave for me. <laughs> I think Zoom likes us today. Mm. So hopefully this is coming up now, folks. Yeah. Maybe, uh, David, you can put it to your actual PowerPoint and yep. we're ready to go. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. That's good. Um, welcome, everybody. And thanks to Adita for giving us that sort of background explanation into the journey so far. So what I'm going to talk about is really how you can use some of that technology and start to implement it every day in your own workspace. Um, we talk now about creating digital workforce. So these are people or systems that sit alongside your, your own staff. Um, the focus of these digital workforce is really to help you overcome some of those repetitive, tedious tasks that exist in any business that add little or no value. And, and in make, many cases, also, uh, Dieter alluded to this as well, some of the analytics side of things. So being able to do things where you simply don't have the resources or the manpower to kind of use all of that massive amounts of data that's now coming at us every day to, to research that, to trawl through that information and to make intelligent decisions about how it can help your business. So that's pretty critical to, to what we're trying to do. In terms of 
RPA itself. Um, there's lots of research, lots of numbers banded around about how much of the tasks that exist in a business can be automated. The general view is it's around about a third. McKinsey would say that probably up to 50% of people's time is wasted in one way or another. Um, so really the key thing for us is to try and think of the tasks that we do do every day um, on a very repetitive basis and that could be put into some form of automation. It doesn't have to be the whole process. It can be part of the process. And if you think about some of the things we do, we actually just want to get some information and make sure that information is the current information, you know, what our sales might look like, you know, what our investment in a certain area might look like. So all of that can be brought up into a screen by robots that you could deploy to make and analyze that uh, current data set that you have. So our job is really to take advantage of the AI and the machine learning that is uh, now built into this different set of software and think about how we can use that effectively around our business. And when we often see, you know, things we do all of the time, copy and paste data, open new files, move files around, send out reminders, all of that stuff is really things that robots do very well and can do extremely quickly. This is a, a real key point to that. So RPA is around mimicking what our uh, people currently do and finding ways to make that more effective and more productive inside our own organization. And it's worth noting that even with all of this smart technology we've been able to acquire and amass over the last uh, few decades, in fact, productivity on a workforce base is declining. So we still got a lot of catch up to do to get us back to some of the productivity levels that were pre-2000. So this is an interesting area, and as uh, Adita alluded to, there's a long way to go still. We're still at the, the first runs of these, uh, this journey, and you'll see some of these companies have only been around a relatively short time now and are worth lots of money. So in terms of is it worth it? Well, uh, Leslie Wilcox will certainly say it is, and he's uh, a guy that's been working and looking at lots of different companies. And most of the companies that have gone on this journey believe that it is worth it. They're seeing increased productivity. They're seeing, in many cases, reduced costs. And more importantly, they're releasing their staff to be able to do more productive work. I mean, you know, all of us are, you know, creative or think things through quite differently. A robot will only do what you tell it to do. It will follow the process and the steps that you've created for it. It won't think outside the box. An interesting one, if you process invoices and you get these invoices coming every day at you, one of those will be a credit note. And it's quite easy for a, an automation process to say, okay, it's another invoice, so let's pay this credit note. So there are things that you have to spot and detect within the automation itself to make sure you make, don't make some pretty dumb decisions that any individual would pick up very naturally. So it's important that we think about these things and we manage these things in a very careful way. McKinsey think that the early adopters have an advantage. And um, there are, you could say now with, We've been on this journey for at least four or five years. It's accelerating, um, but there are probably, I would say, you know, hundreds of thousands of bots already working inside organizations. And we now see that, uh, you know, new players are coming into this market. It's also worth it. We're seeing return on investments that are pretty quick. You can certainly get an automation in place within a matter of months, and it can actually give you a feedback or a payback within the first year. In terms of the return on investment, we're seeing certainly um, four, an average of four, but many times that in terms of uh, the benefit the organization can get on the financial side, as well as also on the productivity side. There's some other benefits to, towards the, what the employees are now able to do, because they're freeing up their time to do more interesting work and to more beneficial work from the organizations. The kind of, the kind of areas that uh, RPA is currently being used, and this is a kind of really cut down list to probably more suit the types of uh, uh, industries that you guys work in. So typically finance and accounting, invoice pricing, all of the, uh, the bank reconciliation processes, 
um, and some interesting, all of the ARAP work is a potential area for automation. And as, as I mentioned earlier, not all of the end-to-end -end tasks, perhaps just sections of the different tasks uh, that you can automate. In banking, all of the major banks pretty much around the world are investing in RPA and AI. Uh, a lot of it's focused on customer services areas like application forms and that kind of uh, application. Um, research into companies, obviously, and compliance reporting. These are areas that are critical to banking, particularly, uh, you know, Aditra mentioned SOX. We've also got the, the Royal Commission that's driving greater levels of reporting and compliant, uh, measurable compliance against those, those changes that are required. Uh, we also see it in HR. HR is another area where you've got, obviously, the issue of how do we manage large work workforces? How do we make sure the payroll is correct? How do we make sure if we recruit these people, what their CVs or what their qualifications look like? And if we've got uh, groups of people that are remote from us, how do we manage their time? How do we report holidays? All of these are areas where they lend themselves to some level of, uh, of RPA and automation. More interesting for us, and we've sort of been talking to ICAC in particular about how could we use RPA to detect fraud? The obvious things that you could do now, right now, are duplicate payments. So payments going to the same person or by mistake, quite oftenly, but sometimes on purpose. Uh, we also can use uh, the RPA to check out the ownership of the company. We can go to the ASIC uh, sites, draw down data on companies. We can look at invoices. We can assess all of those in invoices. We can see if they map back to what the expected claims would be. Uh, we can look at fictitious invoices, and obviously we can see price variations. So these are the sort of things that we're seeing are already in play. Uh, these are widely used and not new, um, but there are areas here which you and your own organization, if you're doing this, um, may, be, may be new to you. In most cases, if you look at the, uh, the work that's already been done, most of that is around compliance reporting. So it's a lot of it skewed to that. Uh, but increasingly, we're seeing that shift towards the opportunity to undertake work where we don't have the manpower and the resources to do that. So the investigative work, the analytical work is I think the far more interesting work that we can do going forward. Who are the players? Um, I hope you can see the screens coming up uh, large enough for you. The biggest two players are UiPath and Automation Anywhere. UiPath only started life in 2005, uh, it's uh, out of Romania out of Bucharest. Um, it was, uh, sorry, it went public at the beginning of this year and it was valued at 35 billion in the IPO that, uh, so it's, you can see in a relatively short time, it's uh, amassed an enormous amount of uh, customers and value to reflect that. Automation anywhere is smaller, also now based in the US, um, but certainly those two are the sort of main two contenders. Um, there was a third company called Blue Prism that would, you could say were part of the main three in the, in the field. But Blue Prism has now recently been sold, in fact, in the last month to a private equity company from the US. And Blue Prism had a speciality, if you like, in the, the higher end automation field and is used by most of the major banks around the world and telcos where there is a Highly, high need for data integrity and scalability in terms of their RPA solutions. The interesting one for us is Microsoft. So Microsoft has been in the automation game for a little while and it bought a company called Soto Motive last year. That was a UK based, if I remember rightly. Um, but the one thing about Microsoft, it's already embedded on all of our desktops. So I think what we'll see is that uh, RPA or automation will start to become more, not so much the business as usual, but more normal for us to think about what could we do? I mean, every day we get in and probably have a, an Outlook folder with massive amounts of emails. You know, how many of us tidy them up, put them in little folders so we could find them? You could just simply do a little bot that could do that for you. So that's the kind of thing that I believe Microsoft will, with their Power Automate product, will start to make 
small individual uh, type applications that benefit us from a personal perspective. So, and another important point to focus on is that most of the big players offer everyone a free version of their software. And what they're trying to encourage is what they call citizen developers. So people within your own firm, people from outside, certainly university students are able to access this data and learn from the enormous amounts of online training that exists to support each of these different products. So it's a space that's quite interesting and it's a space that is evolving fairly rapidly. And as Adita mentioned, all of them offer tools that can do this process mining. So you can sit it on your laptop and you can let it run and it will show you um, what each step of the process is happening, how different people apply the same process. And then it can print out a nice chart to show you the workflow that's taking place. So they're pretty sophisticated tools that uh, are in play today. Um, in terms of the risks, well, the biggest risk is really that we don't do enough planning. We don't do enough thinking about what our organization exactly requires. In most of us, we've got business processes. And it's interesting, there's an outfit in the US called AQPC that's a not-for-profit. And they've mapped out most of the core businesses, sorry, core processes that a business has. And there's around about 300 of them. So it's a lot of processes. And as uh, you know, we talked about earlier, most of these processes are not well mapped. It takes time and effort to map them. And people don't keep those processes up to date. So we're seeing that it's very difficult to see if we've got a good rules-based process, we could map the workflow. Um, but in most cases, you have to go on this voyage of discovery right at the beginning and try to optimize those processes before you try to automate them. Um, we also see that the systems that we use, and everybody's got a financial system, maybe an ERP, or maybe some specialized software, but they've invested in them, but people kind of move. People, the churn in a business means that a lot of the inbuilt knowledge that the organization had at the beginning is now lost. So we're seeing that many people don't know how to use the systems they have or what you can do with the systems. And then when you try to automate them, you come up with, well, how do we do that? And nobody really knows the answer to those. So getting to know and how to use your systems and keeping them up to date is pretty, pretty critical. People also do things their own way. They're individuals. We like to not be bored by doing the same thing. So we do different process steps, but that can often lead to inconsistent output. So when we do the exercise, really trying to fun, find what we need, the first thing to do is get that group of people together, get them to talk through what they do and why they do it, and then to try and get consensus, consensus on the, the right way to do it and the best way for the business. And lastly, what we see is that the systems we have have all been acquired at different points, and particularly if you've gone through a series of acquisitions where you've got different systems from different uh, organizations, they're very poorly integrated. So they don't talk to each other very well. And one of the things that we need from our processes is that we pull data from different areas. You're all used to taking information out of Excel, pasting it into maybe another uh, format, and then using that data in a different way. So we need that integration. We need that uh, ability to take information from one place and put it into another. What we need to do, if you're also thinking about this journey, is really your own ability to project manage it. Often people think they can do that, but it requires quite a lot of effort and it requires that oversight to make sure people really do what they, you've asked them to do to get that job going. So that's one of the risks that you need to be very con conscious about before you start on this journey. In terms of the lessons that we can learn from the early adopters is to engage IT early. Whilst this is really a business process issue, we do depend on the IT systems and the IT infrastructure that we deal with. So the first thing to do is make sure we engage them. It's also worth thinking about a proof of concept or a small pilot project where you can test this out, make sure everybody's on board. People are fearful 
of uh, automation. They think it's going to take their jobs. In reality, our experience is it doesn't do that at all. It creates opportunity, it creates opportunity for new jobs and much more interesting jobs that they can do. We also can actually do this optimization of the process. So we benefit, even if we didn't automate it, we could see the benefits that we get from optimizing the existing process. And lastly, we want to use RPA to drive our strategy for the business as much as for just those simple processes. So those are the key things that we need to, to be mindful of in whether we go forward with this or not. There's some very simple things you can do. You can bring a team together and you can look through the obvious candidates for some of the work if you're not already considering that. Obviously, invoice processing, that kind of thing is the, uh, the first cab off the rank to think about. So these are kind of just simple tools that you could use. Think about the characteristics of the process. Think about how easy it is to do right now. Are there a good set of rules that we could use that we could map this process through? And then we can just rank those and create a good candidate to, to start with. I think the most important thing is that journey be taking place with your own team. And if I can quote um, somebody within Mackay Goodwin, um, we've done three sets of automation for Mackay Goodwin. Um, one of the people there said, I would be happy never to do another disbursement. And for her, getting that right, being able to do that took so much weight off her day-to-day -day operation, releases her to do more interesting things. So that's, a, that's an important benefit of engagement with the, with the business. So the journey itself, if you want to go down the RPA journey, is to think about, you know, how, learn about the background to RPA. We've talked about where it came from, but it's in, important to talk about where it is today and maybe talk to people who've already done that. There's lots of organisations in Australia already heavily involved with RPA and I'm sure would adequately uh, be prepared to share time and experience with you. Select that project, select it in a way that engages the business, select it in a way that uh, you've got the input of exactly what's happening today. And then you deploy that to robot, choose which system you want, which of those providers that you want. They're all out there trying to uh, sell to you. Um, and then you can get on the roadmap to installing that. A note of caution is to remember that these are systems based so all of these systems have passwords, have upgrades, and there's a lot of maintenance required to make sure your robots continue to work satisfactorily and smoothly uh, across the, the period of time that you're using it. And, it. and it is one of these things that requires some management and oversight to that. So in terms of the business case, is it worth it? Um, there's no question it can save you time and it can save you money. Uh, the return on investments, as I mentioned, for me, the biggest issue is to try and increase that productivity by releasing your team from the routine, often tedious and often boring activities that are part of what we do every day. And to make your organization more responsive to your customers' needs and to be able to try and put some new innovative ideas in play that will allow your company to have a competitive advantage over the others. I mentioned that um, we've done some work with uh, Mackay Goodwin. So we've done billings, disbursement, uh, BAS. This is kind of a short summary of the process steps, not like quite as complex as the one Adita showed you before, but obviously um, uh, Mackay Goodwin have a system called Core IPS, which is uh, currently a, a desktop application that's moving to a cloud but hasn't quite moved there yet. Um, so we launch uh, Core IPS, uh, we search for the particular cases where we need to run the, uh, the BAS, we navigate to the BAS form, download the form, then navigate to the receipts and payments form, download the information, combine the information, and then push it that out. So it's all done in one step. Um, obviously, it's an interesting thing to, uh, to try and do. I'm gonna try and show you just a, a short video. There's obviously a lot of sensitive information that uh, Mackay Goodwin have, so I can't show you all of that. Oh, sorry, I can't do that because it's not working. <laughs> um, it should show us, so no, I can't do that. But I've, if you're interested, I'm sure we can get uh, 
MacIfer with permission to show you how this automation works and the time it takes to do something compared with the previous time that it took. So hopefully that was interesting to you and informative to if you're interested in developing that uh, digital workforce. And I'm happy to hand it back to Don and to see what questions we have. Thank Thanks, you. David. Thanks, Thanks David. Thanks, David. You look very useful. I'll start it off with, yeah, look, Mackay Goodwin um, has um, um, utilised the services from David and, and we do our buses um, are done through a robotic process and it's definitely cut a lot of time from our staff, um, you know, and they can allocate that time towards, you know, thinking work rather than the process driven work. Um, we are looking at actually now um, expanding that process to other areas of our practice. Um, so yeah, it's definitely very worthwhile. Oh, look, I've got a few, I'll start off with a few questions. So first one's a very basic question, which I have is, is there a difference, um, and that's probably for Professor Aditya, is there a difference between AI and robotics? Um, you know, they're used many times in the same context, but is there a difference between the two? So as I was saying, the notion of robotics, uh, me, the word means different things to different people, right? So you talk to a, a mechanical engineer and a robotic, the word robotics is about robot arms and self-driving cars and so on. You talk to somebody in my line of business, we understand that robotics means robotic process automation. Then let's take, let's lock into my kind of people, and then let's ask the question: Is the idea of robotics does it include everything in AI? The answer is obviously not. So certainly the state of industry play suggests that we are just scratching the surface of what AI can do, um, and companies are going to get more and more invested in doing more and more sophisticated versions of AI. So we can see the roadmap. But it's it's uh, you know people are really at the starting point now. Um, so yeah, AI has a lot to offer, um, and we we've got to be also careful about what we take AI to mean because there's a huge space there. Um, there is the kind of AI that the Facebooks and Googles of the world want us to believe is the only kind, but that's they're not really the only kind. There are other kinds as well, um, all of which deliver value. So yeah, so, so there's a lot of stuff to be done. We're at the starting point. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, David, this question for you, and obviously um, you said it's a frequently asked question, so I think it's worthwhile asking. I mean, uh, and also it's interesting, and I definitely can vouch for um, the return on investment once, you know, um, it, people do venture into the, the, the process-driven, um, you know, automation. There's a return on investment, I think you said between you know one to 10 and maybe a four as an average, but how expensive can, can the process uh, cost? How can it be, how expensive can it be? Yeah, I mean, obviously from that point of view, it depends on the complexity of what process you want to automate. As I said, the automation companies will offer you the citizen development, so you don't have to buy a license. You can actually start to do some of that stuff free. Um, you obviously have to build the processes, but typically we talk in terms of 40 to 50 to 60,000 as a small process uh, uh, automation. We're looking to only do that where it makes sense, where you're going to get your money back in terms of doing that. So we, the first step we do is to do that workshop, work with the organization to understand some basic uh, tools that we have that you can deploy that looks at the different processes. Then we come in and see what's behind them, what systems you interface with. Um, and then once we do that, we make the business case for that uh, so that you can sell that within your own organization, get the funding for that. Um, you have obviously the development cost and then you have an annual license cost. And that license cost, again, depends on the level of sophistication. Do you have a, a cloud license, a, a desktop license? Um, so all of those things. but you can you can certainly get into this on your own. Uh, that's number one. And number two, if you bring in people like us, uh, then it's it starts with that sort of level of uh, small size. That certainly the pilots get you on board to do that, and then to grow from there into something that uh, is much more sustainable. I mean, some of the automation we've done is is quite large, um, but most importantly, I think it's. It's only worth doing if you do that original planning and do that effectively. 
Yeah. I mean, look, it's interesting. Uh, I've, um, I've recently been involved in a case um, which is obviously made, was all publicised. Um, the forum group, which was, has probably has been labelled the largest bank fraud in Australian banking history. Um, you know, and me having looking back in, in, on that file, um, I do definitely think if they, if a bank or you know if there was a robotic process, um, you know, with the banking's lending procedures, I'd say the, the error or the fraud would have been picked up a lot earlier. Um, yep. Because there's just things that what happens, you know, what, is people are used to. Well, that's what's you know the previous employee did. So we're just going to continue with that sort of um, you know digging digging deep into the actual back end of the paperwork and, 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 and the data of that paperwork. So, you know, I think in the banking space to eliminate fraud, I think it's going to be a big, big part integral to, to, to avoid, you know, fraud of that magnitude. Yeah, I think, I think fraud is one of the areas. I mean, there, are, there is work being done in this area already. So yeah. let's not say that, but you can start again, just look at, uh, you know, if you've got an ABN, you know, is, does, if you've got an invoice with an ABN on it, does that company, is it registered for not ABN or not? So often people, small people actually push out invoices with an ABN or with DST on it, but they're not registered for ABN. So, you know, yeah. that's, you know, you could do that in a second, you know, a yeah. nanosecond on the robot terms. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. I had a matter where we um, we identified fraud, debit finance fraud, fraud and, um, you know, it was about a thousand invoices, um, and you know, if an employee had to go through a thousand, and they, they did pick it up, but it took us a while. You know, amongst the one thousand invoices, there was common ABNs, common addresses. So you'd have, you know, a credit, a, a debtor, and somehow it had the same address as you know, debtor number one hundred and fifty, and then yeah. debtor number one hundred and ninety nine, and there was a common address, which took a while for us to pick up. But I'd say if you had a robotic process, that would have been picked up. Very yep. easily, yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely, definitely saves time. Um, guys, look, I don't think there's any more questions. Um, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's a, it's quite an interesting topic, and I do definitely think there's a, um, it is a space that the accounting and finance industry, especially and banking, will be adopting um, at a, um, you know, uh, at an increasing rate. So thank you very much for today's uh, presentations. It was very helpful. Um, on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll end the webinar. Thank you all. Thank you, Dom. Thanks, guys. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.